Amen. Thank you, Dan, and choir and orchestra for that introduction to worship time. And good morning. Good morning. Good morning to those who are watching online. Thank you for joining us. We're glad you're worshiping in here with us in spirit, even though you're at home or in someplace else. If there's anything we can do for you, pray for you. We want to hear from you, so please reach out to the uh, church office. And for those who are coming in, we're going to end the service with the Lord's Supper. Even those who are online, if you would have those elements, the bread and the cup ready, uh, go ahead and do that. And here, who are on campus, if you did not receive the elements, can you raise your hand? Did everyone get the cup and the juice? Look at that. We're 100% this morning. How about that? Good job in the back. All right. Yeah, if you didn't get it, uh, raise your hand. We'll get that to you. But as Pastor Whitney said last week, we're going to take a break from the Matthew series. And uh, today, obviously, we're going to talk about Thanksgiving, looking to the actual Thanksgiving, preparing for the Lord's Supper. And in a couple of weeks, we're going to be moving into the Advent season because Christmas will be here after Thanksgiving, right? Not until Thanksgiving and a mini series there. But today, again, Thanksgiving. Being thankful, having gratitude. Praising God for his providential care. God provides for his people. God cares for his people. He, he loves on his people. He guides his people. He is always with us. He said he will never leave us nor forsake us. And so it's right to give thanks. Now, as I was praying through this, where to start, lots of different ways to go with sort of a Thanksgiving message, right? Lots of scriptures to turn to. One passage of scripture kept coming to mind. God put in my heart, revealed it in many ways as I'm reading through my own personal devotions, as people were talking about certain things, even saw it uh, one time as I was just reading uh, through a, uh, a devotional. It is 1 Thessalonians 5, 18. Are you familiar with that passage? I uh, hope you are or will be after this morning. 1 Thessalonians 5, 18, one verse, one passage of Scripture, and here it is. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. There's a lot there to unpack. There's a challenge there. But before we look into it, I want to talk about the history of why Paul wrote this. What was going on in Thessalonica? It's important just to give a glimpse of that. So, so as I give you some insight into what's going on in Thessalonica, will you turn to Acts 17? Now, if you want to stay in 1 Thessalonians, you can. It's a simple verse. Take it to heart. Memorize it. But dog ear it in your Bible. Put your finger there. Move to Acts 17. What's going on in Thessalonica? What is this city? It's a coastal city in Macedonia. So it's a port city, and it's a main area for those traveling from the east to the west and vice versa. And so it's an important place to put a church. That's why Paul gets there. Let's share the gospel, let's build a church, because people are coming and going, traveling over the land, but also by sea. So it's a great way to get people saved or get the message of the gospel into people's hands as they take it to their homes when they go home. It's busy and well-traveled. It's also a free city. The Roman Empire, a free city, meant that you were exempt from taxes. So they were happy. That was a fun place to be. They were exempt from taxes, and most of the people there were ex-military. It was sort of a part of their retirement. Why? Because they lived there tax-free. They're on the port. They're there by the water. They're enjoying this comfortable lifestyle. So if anybody wanted to invade, they were there to stop it. So it was a great strategy by the Roman Empire, wasn't it? So there in this city, you'd have lots of loyalists. People who would love Caesar and the government. So now here comes Paul and his entourage 
sharing the gospel, which includes there is one king, not Caesar. And so that's frustrating. That would raise a lot of eyebrows and get a lot of these loyalists upset. And so they're not liking this message. Because again, they're loyalists. They're going to defend the Roman Empire. And so in the midst of this, in Acts 17, beginning in the first part there, here comes Paul and his entourage as they come to Thessalonica. And they begin to share the gospel. And it says, as the word says, if you have it open in Acts 17, some are getting saved, some are hearing, some are not. That's just normal when you share the gospel. But then it causes sort of an uprising, or they're accused of having an uprising. So we're going to pick this up just in verses 6 through 9 toward the end of this little section, and, and this is what the word says. When they could not find them, that is, when the city officials came out to get Paul and to get these Christians, and they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities because they were meeting at Jason's house. So they bring them out before the authorities and they're shouting, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. And Jason has received them, and they are all acting against the decrees of Caesars, saying that there is another king, Jesus. And the people in the city and authorities were disturbed and when, they heard, when they heard these things. And when they had taken money as security from Jason, okay, be sure not to preach this gospel or be on your guard. Be careful what you say now. They, they, uh, and, and the rest, they let them go. So here is some adversity. Here is problems. There's persecution. There's hostility. And yet Paul writes to the church and tells them, give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. They're having trouble preaching the gospel. It's a hostile environment. There's adversity. They're not liking these Christians, nor the message that they have. Can't help but think of America today. Who do these Christians think they are? Telling us what to do, what's right and what's wrong. Trying to give us moral guidance. Who do they think they are? But you know, sadly, there was a time in our history when believers were looked to to be the conscience of society. Whether they were believers or not, whether they were Jewish or another religion, they looked to the church, faithful evangelical churches. They looked to believers to determine what was right and what was wrong. To be a moral guide not so much anymore. So by God's divine guidance and wisdom, Paul is writing to them and to us, challenging them, challenging us to cultivate a nature, a character of joy in the Lord, no matter what. Develop an attitude of gratitude. To, to possess within our inward man thankfulness, Praise be to God, no matter what. And it begins this section, rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. The question becomes, how can we give thanks in all circumstances? How do we cultivate a nature of the joy of the Lord? How do we develop an attitude of gratitude? Let's pray and jump into it. Father God, we thank you. We thank you that you're speaking to your people. You, we gather here not to hear from me, but to hear from you. Holy Spirit, Give us ears to hear and hearts to receive what you have for us this morning. We desperately need to hear from you. 
But it's in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. First thing is this. We must look through our current circumstances to God. Look through your current circumstances to God. Because see, things happen in life. Whether it's busyness or trials or struggles or difficulties, no matter what they are, they they cloud us from actually seeing God. It blurs our vision. It captures our attention. Someone at the early services told me as they were leaving the day grew up as missionaries in foreign country, and one time they were in a, a coastal city, a coastal area, and they could look out the window and they could see everything, and it was beautiful. But where they went to in an inner city, in another country, they had bars on the window where they lived. She said as a little girl, she kept looking at the bars, looking at the bars. She's like, this is weird. This is scary. But she said, you know, God told her to look through the bars and see the beautiful surroundings through the bar. And once she did that, she didn't see the bar anymore. Look through the circumstances to God who was always there. God is constant, God is consistent, God is in control. Remember that. God is always constant, God is always consistent, his nature never changes, and he's in control. Think of God's nature and his character, his promises. Remember the times he's shown up in your life. He'll be consistent. See, develop a strong relationship, a vibrant relationship with the Lord because everything that we do, everything we are called to do comes from that relationship. Don't let circumstances distract you because it's easy to be distracted, isn't it? Distraction, it literally means something that takes your attention away from what you're supposed to be doing. Something that takes your attention away from what you're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be thankful to God, praising God, because that's his will for us. Distraction, dis, that means to take away. Traction, from where you are grounded. In Latin, it literally means to be drug away. You're taken away. So let me ask you, do you ever get distracted? Are you distracted now? (laughs) It's kind of early in the message to be distracted. Is your stomach growling because you're ready for lunch? Mm -hmm. Is he too loud? A preacher, I can't hear a word he's saying. It's too soft. Uh, It's too cold in here. Will you turn to your neighbor and say, Don't be distracted? Somebody do it now. Don't be distracted. Wake up, because it's easy to be distracted. Driving with a cell phone, right? Distraction, yeah, ooh, don't do that. But you know what I notice? The hands-free is just as worse. You know why? Because I'm a preacher, I use my hands. So I'm driving, I'm talking, and I might have the phone in my hand, but I'm doing like this. That's still distracted. You talk with your hands. You reach for your coffee, where's it at? You spill it, oh, where's it going? You miss your, your turn. You're trying to flip the radio and you push it on the steering wheel and it goes too fast, too slow. But then you say, look, pronghorn, aren't they pretty? Whoa. <laughs> you get distracted. In the office, we used to call it shiny things. We'd be meeting together, praying together, have a focus. What is God calling us to do? Looking at some activity or ministry or something. And, and all of a sudden, the shiny thing pops in and we're off here on that tangent and running down here. Shiny things. Look through your current circumstances to God who is consistent, who is constant, who is in control. Your circumstances change. And it may take time. But your circumstances, they change. But God never does. Joseph in the Old Testament. He was the favorite son, right? He's sold into slavery, goes through all kinds of adversity. But until the story is over, it took years of pain, of sorrow, of disappointment, of frustration. Circumstances change, and it may take time, but God never does. David is anointed king. You're going to be king, David. How long did it take for him to become king? 
Most scholars suggest 15 years of running from Saul and all that trial and struggles and sorrow. Regardless, God is growing you. God is changing your heart, giving you more compassion to become like him. He's giving you grace. He's preparing you for things. He's walking with you. Trust God through all things. Peter failed, didn't he? Peter's called to walk on the water. The man's walking on the water. He's looking right at Jesus. I'm coming to you. This is cool stuff. And then he begins to see, look at the waves, look at the wind. And he begins to look at the circumstances, not his Savior and Lord, and he begins to drown. David was distracted, right, with many things. But when a time when kings are out at war, he's at home, and he's distracted by this beautiful woman he keeps seeing. Mary and Martha, the word says Martha was distracted by housework. Now, I'm not saying live in a dirty house. <laughs> so don't hear what I'm not saying. But where are our priorities? Is it more important to clean the house or sit at the feet of Jesus? Is it more important to spend time with family and friends and build relationships? Or to make sure the chores are done. Look through your circumstances to God who remains consistent, constant, and in control. Keep your eyes on the road. Keep your eyes, as the Bible says, on the prize. But two, understand that it's God's will for you to give thanks in all circumstances. It's God's will for you to do that. God wills that you do that. We often ask as believers, and, and rightly so, what's God's will for my life? What's God's will for me at this time? What am I supposed to do? So I want to commit to you a book, Emerson Egrich's. I gave it to a friend to read, and he has it. It's called The Four Wills of God. The basic premise of this book is to say this. In the Bible, there's four times where God says this is God's will, and this is one of them. The whole premise is, he says, start here. Get these four wills right, and the others will fall into place. The Four Wills of God by Emerson Egrich's. He's most popular for the love and respect book that Karen and I teach here at the church. If we get those right and start here, everything else falls into place. This is God's will for you. This word for, for will is the thelema, which means will. It's God's desire. God has a purpose for you to give thanks. Why? Because he wants to change your heart. He wants to teach you. He wants to use you. He wants to grow you and mature you that you may see him in a different light that you may see him and he is glorified. But it also has the understanding of a choice or a determination. So in other words, God's desire for all believers is for us to make the choice to determine in our hearts that we will give thanks in all circumstances. This is God's desire that you draw near to him and praise him and give him thanks. This will warm his heart, and he will be glorified. It also brings blessings, and he changes you. He prepares you, and he uses you. Look to God, submit to God as he prepares you for what's ahead. He knows we just follow him along the journey. He's growing us, maturing us, and wants to use our story to impact the lives of others. Number three, make time to thank God for all things, starting with the good things of life. Starting with the good things of life. Do you thank God for the good things of life? Do you take the time to give him thanks? Well, when things are favorable, when life is favorable, when life is good, do you pause to give him thanks? This should be easy, but sometimes it's not. Do we take the time to do it? 
Thank God for the blessings that we do have. How many of you woke up in a warm house this morning? Did you? Yeah? Maybe you have a cheap husband like me. Maybe not as warm, but it could be worse. Yeah? Yeah, uh, see, you drove here in a car, did you not? Yeah, I didn't say what type of car, right? But you drove here in a car. You went to work this past week, did you? Or some of you are enjoying retirement. Yeah, I see that smile already. I got you, okay? I get it. Praise God and thank God. How about the people in your life? Your spouse, your children, your grandchildren, your friends? your church home, your Sunday school class, your life group. There are people in your life who bring you joy. There are people that you can count on in tough times that you can turn to when you have questions, when you need a hug. Give thanks for them. There are people in your life that are going to rejoice with you when you rejoice and grieve with you when you grieve. Give thanks to God for these people. Do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Give thanks for the peace and his presence that's with you. That your eyes have been opened up and you see. And that you have hope because of the Lord. You see, when we think of giving thanks in all circumstances, our minds tend to drift to the negative, don't they? The difficult and trying times and we'll get there. But let's start with the easy stuff. The story told in Luke 17 actually happened. It's not just a story. Jesus is traveling from Samaria and Galilee, and he encounters 10 lepers. And they come up to Jesus, and because they have to stay together. They have to stay outside the camp. And they come up to Jesus. Jesus, please have mercy and, and heal us. Please, Jesus, heal us. And he heals all 10. And he sends them on their way. But only one, a Samaritan, comes back to give him thanks and praise. This is what Jesus says. Jesus answered, we're not ten cleansed. Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner, a Samaritan? And he said to him, rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. This is the will of God to give thanks. Be the one who comes to God and says, thank you, God. If no one else will, I will. I will give you thanks. I will praise your name. Be the one who will come back no matter what the other nine do or what the other nine say. You be the one who understands James 1.17. Every good and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. Pause and give God thanks for who you are and what you do have. And now we turn to the trying times, right? Give thanks to God in the trying times of life. Ever gone through a trying time? Ever have difficulty? Ever have struggles? God says, give thanks in these, in these moments, while you're in them. Not just when they're over, not when you get through them. Yeah, give thanks then. But you know what? While you're in them, give him thanks. Why? Because he's with you. God is counting you worthy. God wants to teach you and grow you and mature you and use your story to impact the life of somebody else. Because it's not always about us. It's about God's glory. Romans eight twenty eight, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. Back to Joseph in the Old Testament. Karen and I are working through this in our morning devotion. Sometimes we read it, sometimes we have it played, and we listen to it as we're getting ready for work in the morning. Came to Joseph in the Old Testament. And it's working through Genesis. And just think about his story. He had this dream, and yeah, he flaunted it from his brothers, was hated by his brothers. But think about all the adversity, all the trials, all the pain, all the sorrow that he went through. Yet he stayed faithful to God. He sought to do what is right, even in the midst of all that. 
painful events over a long period of time. And how does the story end? Genesis 50, verse 20. He says to his brothers finally, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. To bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. Praise God. Painful events, adversity, trials in your life cannot and must not cause us to believe that only bad will come from the situation. That's not true. God will be glorified. God will be revealed. God will be praised among the nations. Don't let these times distract you from praising God and connecting with him. Let's just say you had the ability to go back in time. And you ended up back in Israel, time of Jesus. And you realize that this is the day, as you're back there, that Jesus is put to death on the cross. All that transpires there. The disciples are running in fear. They're panicking. They're disappearing. There's chaos Everyone's hiding behind doors that they were followers. And they're thinking, Jesus is dead. We were hoping he was the Messiah. And as you're walking along the streets, you come across Peter at that fire, and he's warming his hands. Peter's frustrated. He's upset. He doesn't know what to do. He's heard Jesus say these things. He's trying to put it all together and doesn't understand. And you know, though, because you know the end of the story, but you also know that just in a few minutes, he's going to deny his Lord and Savior three times. And you walk up to Peter and say, hey, Peter, I'm a Christian from the future. He's going to look at you like you're crazy. Let's get beyond that. It's just a story, okay? He's going to look at you like you're crazy, but you're going to say, I'm a Christian from the future. And you know what we call this? We call this day Good Friday. It's Good Friday. And Peter's going to look at you like you're crazy. What do you mean it's Good Friday? The master's gone. He's dead. We thought he was the Messiah. Because you know what? You know the end of the story. He doesn't. In the midst of it, he doesn't understand, but you do. Sunday is coming. Never forget that. You have a choice. You can either grumble or have gratitude. You can either grumble or have gratitude. And you know the thing is, both of those are contagious. If you're around people who grumble long enough, you're going to begin grumbling. Ideally, you run like crazy because nobody wants to be around them. But also those people who have the joy of the Lord in their hearts. They're attractive. People are drawn to them. You have your choice. You can grumble or have gratitude. Billy Graham once said, Thanksgiving, the giving of thanks to God for all his blessings should be one of the most distinctive marks of the believer in Jesus Christ. We must not allow a spirit of ingratitude to harden our hearts and chill our relationship with God and others. You know people who like to grumble? That like to complain? Now is not the time to look at your wife nor your husband. (laughs) Just want to be fair. The weather outside is too cold. It's too warm. We need rain. We have too much rain. It's making my hair curl, all this humidity. (laughs) And I just say, uh, we're in Arizona, people. The music's too loud. It's too soft. It's too contemporary. The government, they're not doing enough. The government, they should get out of everything. And how about this one? Don't California my Arizona. (laughs) I'm on thin ice, ain't I? Uh Coming from the guy from Ohio via Florida. Disenfranchised. One of God's desires for his people is to give thanks in all circumstances. This is the way it's written. It means no excuses, 
no exceptions, literally in ponti in Greek, in connection with everything that occurs. In connection. In other words, in connection with everything in life, give thanks. No matter what it might be, give thanks. Why? Because God is consistent. God is constant. God is in control. And God is at work. Believe and trust in the Lord. Give thanks. It's fall, and I'd like to work in a football story once again. (laughs) This time from the Ohio State University Buckeyes. I want to introduce you to Cameron Babb. Cameron Babb is a story I didn't even know all of it until I Googled it after some things transpired a couple weeks ago. He was on the field, and I'm going to show that clip in just a second. And what happened was players were giving him respect to have a moment with the Lord, and players and coaches were crying. Cameron Babb, coming out of high school, was one of the highest recruited wide receivers. He was the 13th best wide receiver coming out of high school in the country. One of ESPN's top 300 players. And he ended up at The Ohio State University. (laughs) Coming in as an incoming freshman, he tore his ACL in his knee. By all accounts, from what I read and understand, it's nine months of recovery, if you can recover. He recovers from it. He comes back and tears the ACL in his other knee. Oh, we're not done yet. He overcomes that and comes back and tears his ACL again in his left knee. We're still not done. He comes from back from that and tears his ACL again in his other knee. Four surgeries, four recoveries. Going into his senior year, he has some meniscus, if I'm saying that right, injury, needs another cleaning up or surgical procedure, five procedures. He's already graduated. But here's the thing. He was captain of the team for two of those years. Not because of what he did on the field, but because of what he did behind the scenes. As you see here, he's wearing the block O, The block O is a tradition they started not too long ago, a few years ago, given to a player, as it says here, uh, exhibits toughness, fight, accountability, character, and leadership. He would go to boys and girls clubs and underprivileged schools, inner city places, and he would talk to youth. Saw one of the videos where they had him up front, they showed a clip of it, and he said this, I am Cameron Babb. I play football for the Ohio State University Buckeyes. I no longer play football for honors or to go to the NFL, but that my story may impact the life of someone. My message is never give up because there is a greater purpose for your life. He was voted captain because at practices he was still there. During the games, he was on the sideline. He was cheering his team on. He was encouraging them. He was helping them learn and going over film with other players. Yet he never played. As he came back for his fifth year, he had a medical, what's called a medical red shirt. He was he graduated already with a degree and could play. And he wanted to stay with the team. And so he stayed with the team. And they asked him, Do you think you'll ever get in the game? Do you think you'll ever make a catch? He said, I would love to. What would that moment be like? And he would talk about, I don't know what I'd do in that moment if I ever caught the ball, but I, I'm just here for this. And this is this quote. I think I can be a very explosive and dynamic player, but I just want to play football and be here for Ohio State and for the football team in any way I can. Whatever that may look like, I just give it to the Lord and that's it. I found him in the midst of all these trials and everything I'm going through. He's put so many people around me, all the players and training staff, so I'm not alone. I've never been alone, but I would say the root of it all is Jesus Christ. That's my foundation. He's my everything. And that joy of the Lord became contagious for him because two weeks ago, something happened, and I saw that on TV, and that's what inspired me to want to hear this story. Just feel the emotions that you know the story now. Look at what happens and see the respect by his players.
Cameron Babb. Fifth season with the program. Offensive player of the game. One catch, one touchdown. Not because of what he did on the field, but what he did behind the scenes. How he set an example of living through adversity, trusting in the Lord. God could use him. Even one player in the NFL today, and a lot of the players he played with are in the NFL, gave shout outs. And one player said, Congratulations, Cameron. I wouldn't be who I am or where I am if it wasn't for you. You see, at some point, we have to understand this is not, but not about me and it's not about you, it's about God. It's not about me, it's not about you, but how we can influence and impact the lives of others around us. It's about God's glory, about what he can do in and through us. He who began a good work in you shall continue it till the day of Christ Jesus. And we can only do this if we're in Christ, because that's the caveat here. This is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. God's will in Christ. When we are in Christ, when we accept Christ as our Lord and Savior, we are united to Christ. We are in union with him. We are bound to him, to a person, Jesus. Musicians, you can come on up and get into place. See, when we accept Christ, he becomes our strength. He becomes our courage, our power, if we are in him. In Christ, we are loved by God with an inseparable love. So believer, give thanks. In Christ, we are forgiven and we are redeemed. Give thanks. In Christ, we are justified before a righteous God, not because of what we have done, because of what he has done. So give thanks. In Christ, we are a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. Give thanks. In Christ, we have received all the promises of God. Give thanks. In Christ, we have been sanctified. We have been made holy, and God continues to do his work in and through us so that we may become more like Christ. Give thanks. In Christ, we have eternal life. Give thanks. So Paul, he writes, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. I don't know what's going on in your life. I don't know what trials, struggles you have. But God is consistent, God is constant, God is in control. Give thanks. And if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we want to pray with you. Don't leave here without seeking to understand who Jesus is and receive him as your Lord and Savior. So we're going to do a moment now of prayer and singing before we go into the Lord's Supper. Do business with the Lord. Let God speak to your heart. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your grace, your love, your mercy, and your unbounding joy in your presence. God, do your work within us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. just as you are. Let's sing it together. Come just as you are. Hear the Spirit call. Come just as you are. Come and see. Come receive. Come and live forever. And strength for today to haste the living water and never thirst again. Come just as you are, hear the Spirit call. Come just as you. and see, come receive, come and live forevermore. If you have the elements of the cup and also the bread, please take it out. Those who are joining online, if you have those. Uh, please get those ready now. I'm going to read from 
1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning in verse 23. Paul says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The same way also he took the cup, and after the supper, saying, This cup, it's a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Father God, we thank you for special moments like this. God, that you would draw near to us right now and search our hearts, search our minds. God, reveal anything that is not of you. God, may we confess it, repent of it, and turn it over to you. God, in this moment, we remember your sacrifice. We are thankful for you, Jesus. You are our purpose, our peace. Thank you for the joy that you bring to our lives. Jesus, we recognize you as the Savior, and we know that you gave yourself up. No one took your life, you offered it. Your blood was shed for our forgiveness, and because you live, we live too and shall live eternally. Praise in Jesus' name, amen. Take the wafer out, we'll take it together. Body of Christ given for us. Flip it over, we have the cup. He said, this is the cup shed for the forgiveness of sins. Well, God, thank you. As we remember your sacrifice, we commit to live for you. And to leave this place transformed and changed by your presence and your love. Oh, God. Our God, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Praise in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand as we conclude our time together singing Amazing Grace. Just a reminder.